Namaste and welcome to Pods by PI, a policy discussion series brought to you by Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. My name is Saurabh Lama. In today's episode, I have Bishnu Sapkota in the PEI studio to discuss the early results of the 2022 general elections, the possible implications for the political parties, the surprising rise of the independence, and the future of Nepali politics and policymaking. Bishnu is a noted columnist and commentator of Nepali politics. Up until 2015, he was in charge of the Nepal Transition to Peace a National Track 1.5 peace process program. As the lead, he helped facilitate the dialogue between the political parties during the crucial phases of the Maoist insurgency, the People's Movement, to the promulgation of the new constitution. Mr. Sapkota is an Asian fellow to Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, University of Notre Dame. Vishnu and I begin our discussion on the significance of the 2022 elections and the low voter turnout, the early results and the implication for the political parties. We also discuss the better-than-expected performance of the Rashtra Swatantra Party and also the pre-election movements such as the hashtag No, Not Again. We end on the topic of the likelihood of a hung parliament and its implications for the future of policymaking in Nepal. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Uh, Vishnu, welcome to Pause by PEI. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much for providing your invaluable time with us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, shall we get on with the show? Sure. So the 2022 general elections just concluded, and we're awaiting the poll results. But before we get into discussing the election day and the trends of the initial results themselves, could you give us your take on the significance of this particular election that we just took part in? Was this the election that will bring the political stability needed in the country? Was there anything special about it? So I mean, obviously, in 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 a democracy, every election is important. But for Nepal, I would say this is even more important election than in an uh, in a usual time, because uh, this is only the second election after we got the new constitution in 2015, and we are still in that process or phase of uh, implementation of the of the new constitution. There are still certain provisions which you know there are obviously different political views. So in that sense. Uh, this election um, is more important uh, because it would reflect, you know, h- how people have perceived the, the roles of the uh, those who are, who are there to implement the new constitution. Uh, I think so. There are a number of other factors, but I think this election was uh, was really uh, important. Indeed, some of the trends of the last election do reflect that. So, speaking of the election day itself, uh, you did mention the people's perception. What are your thoughts on the perception of the low voter turnout that is being reported? A figure the Election Commission of Nepal reports to be 61%. Is there anything we can gather from this? What I would like to say before commenting on that is, uh, uh, well, uh, this is only the second election after the new constitution. Uh, the actors, you know, our national political actors, those who have been there, they have been there for too long, for simply too long. So there was this general frustration among the general public, you know, about the incompetence, you know, the corruption and, the, you know, different scandals and all those things. So what people were looking for is, is, a, is a massive change. At the same time, um, what we should understand is that an election uh, is not something which can always bring a massive political change. So the context for the election, therefore, uh, was important. Uh, it, because of people's uh, expectation versus what the political class was or has been able to deliver in the in the last five years. So the voter turnout, to, to come back to this question, if we compare it with the previous elections of Nepal, it is obviously low. And I think that itself is a message because there is a general apathy you know, towards this political class. It's, it's not a good thing that, you know, people should participate in election and should board them out uh, we don't have a you know provision where people can vote you know reject that I don't I don't vote. So I think people chose not to go and cast their vote. That to me is itself uh, one message. And and when we look at it um, in the light of uh, uh, you know what we have seen the early trends of the uh, election results, I think I think there is a consistency between the low turnout and people's desperate uh, desperateness you know to to choose for uh, new parties and new faces. So speaking of the political parties, in the last election, we also saw some electoral alliances made up of strange bedfellows. 
This was something we also touched upon in one of our previous episodes that was based on PEI's own election analysis of alliances among parties that do not traditionally share common ideologies. Uh, check out our episode with PEI's Anurag Acharya and Avinash Karna for that. So as we record this show, we see the Nepali Congress in the lead with UML coming in second. So given these initial results, which analysts are projecting will perhaps hold shape to the end of the vote count, where do you think Nepali party politics will move towards in the coming days? The point you raise about the strengths paid fellows, I think that is critical. That is important. I just would like to comment on that. There are strengths paid fellows uh, in Nepali politics, not just now, but in the last past few years. It's because uh, there's very little these political parties are representing. So their sole goal seems to just stick to being in power in the government. So when it comes to forming a government, they would not care about what, what ideals they represent, what ideological orientations they, ha- they are supposed to represent and, and all that. So it's not for any good reason. So that reflects about, uh, you know, so many evils about Nepal's uh, politics. And this election simply reflected that. So when uh, the elections were just being prepared, everyone was desperate to have an alliance with everyone else, whoever was, you know, available. So um, once they formed the alliances, whatever alliances, you know, the the, the current government's ruling coalition alliance uh, and, and the opposition, there is no principle, there is no vision that brings them together. That's why this this is very, uh, very important uh, when we analyze the election results, how these uh, bets were set and how these fellows came together, you know, as, as it stands, uh, bed fellows. So now let us begin with the political parties. First, let's start with the Grand Alliance, the Maha Gathabandhan. Where do you think the parties go from here? They will go nowhere from here. And I'm very clear about it. Because... Um, as we just talked earlier, uh, you know, these alliances were formed just to come back to power or just to stay in power or come back to power. So if you look at these uh, alliances, uh, on the one hand, I mean, you have centrist, you have Democrats, you have extreme leftists, and you have the most right wing, you have everyone together. And first, they try to form alliances. And once they're able to form whatever possible electoral alliances, then they try to theorize it, you know, give some kind of uh, ideological, uh, you know, quote or whatever. So I think anyone with a critical mind would would not uh, believe in what they're trying to sell. Therefore, from here, you know, uh, what I see is as soon as we have the new election results, the complete results, the new alliances or the, you know, gathabandans, you know, will will begin to shape up or or form. I mean, one is, of course, the the current one, the ruling government uh, parties alliance alliance may continue. That's just one possibility. But what I see is, there will be every effort. Anyone can come together. Anyone can go away from anywhere. It's also because uh, most of this part. I mean, when I when I talk like this, I'm generalizing. I'm I'm aware. There are exceptions within political parties, and there are some parties who may be more more loyal to what they are supposed to represent. But uh, in the big picture, the alliances um, can be formed or broken on the basis of you know the give and take and and the bargain, and that bargain is more for power uh, than for anything else. So, how about the future of the Maoists, who seem to be doing poorly in the polls? The future of the Maoist has been something that we've been speculating, not now, but for the last many, many years. We just have to quickly look uh, back at the 2008, the first constituent assembly elections. They became the largest party, not only largest party, the then Nepali Congress and UML combined were smaller than the Maoist party in the first constituent assembly. And five years later, you know, in, in the in the next uh, second constituent assembly election, the Maoists were a distant third. At that time, we talked about, OK, what is the future? You know, why is it happening? What is it, what is happening? And, and all those questions. And then in, in, in the next election, uh, 2018, um, you know, there was this alliance between the UML and, and the Maoist party. You know, they talked, they, they again tried to give it like a ideological narrative that it's like the 70 years of Nepal's dream for a, you know, communist, uh, you know, revolution, whatever, finally being realized, which is all 
untrue. It, it was a national lie. It was a political lie. It was just to win the electorate, which they did. It, the lie sold well, in my opinion. So that means there was no uh, opportunity for people to evaluate the Maoist because they, they went together in election with, with the UML and, and they did well. And in the local elections a few months ago, the Maoist did relatively well compared to what many were thinking, compared to what even I was assessing. So, and the Maoists were really enthused, you know, with, with the results of the local elections a few months ago. Now, as we have seen the early um, results and the, and the trends, uh, they're not doing well. So what I would like to say is, we talked about this election being very important, more important than in an usual time of, you know, for any democracy, because it is only the second election after the new constitution. I'm just repeating that. That's why when we talk about Maoist, we should not lose sight of this perspective that the big political project of Nepal's, um, you know, state restructuring, changing the character of the state, making Nepal inclusive state, ensuring the ownership of the uh, minorities, various ethnic groups and, you know, women's rights and, you know, all those aspirations of those traditionally marginalized uh, populations, the Maoist people's war, uh, the people's movement of 2006, the Constituent Assembly, and obviously the Madhya's movement and the other ethnic movement, women's movement, all of them came together and the Constituent Assembly was supposed to institutionalize all of them in the new constitution which it has to a large extent, there still are, you know, discontents, as we know. So when we look at the Maoist and evaluate how they will do, many of these issues, whether you like the Maoist or not, were brought to the forefront, you know, and, and other political parties were forced to address and to come together. I'm not saying the Maoist led everything. So, but, but for Nepal to become a republic and then to have a new constitution and all that, the background is, I mean, we should not lose sight of this background. Therefore, the Maoists are not doing well now. They did not do pretty well even in the previous elections, I mean, except for that alliance with the, with the UML, because they were not able to represent their own constituencies. As soon as they got into power in 2008, they were not able to perform. They deviated from what they had promised to the people. I'm not talking about the you know the typical Maoist ideological thing. What they were, it was good that they be, they accepted multi-party democracy in their general convention. Uh, they have accepted democracy, which is all good. It, they were bound to. They had to. They did that. But what I'm talking about is the representation of the marginalized, and 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 their own character that changed as soon as they got into power the rapid speed at which they deteriorated, surpassing the deterioration, the speed of the Congress and the UML, and, and just being one of the others. I think that's why people had a lot of hope in the Maoist. I mean, those who supported Maoist, who hoped from them, were disillusioned in a very short span of time. That is why the, the Maoist at the moment uh, seem to be just uh, just in the balance like on the one hand you have a democratic force nepali congress whether you like it or not you know there's a traditional constituency that congress has always represented right on the other for the moderate left i mean all the so-called left whatever there's the uml and uml has a very strong organizational capacity structure throughout the country compared to the maoist and you have the other regional or ethnic uh, groups, I mean, whether it's one or the other, they always have some. Even now, like Sikhi Rauts rise in, 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 the, in the Eastern Madesh and the uh, Rasti Unmukti party uh, led by Resham Chaudhary, who is in prison in, in the far west. So, I mean, you have uh, those parties who seem to put their hope in those new parties. That means, now what do Maoists represent? That's why I think uh, the Maoist future at the moment, is uh, really uncertain. Uh, so I like how you touched on the UML there. So what does the last election say about the future of the UML? The future of the UML is not bright and clear as long as KP Woli is the chairperson. If you look at the current election and the desperateness, you know, and, and the alliance that uh, KP Woli uh, tried and enforced, is like you, ha you have Kamal Thapa and Rajinder Lingden as UML alliance. What does it tell about them? And 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 think about uh, what K P Woli has been saying uh, or has I mean, did you know when he was prime minister? So I would like to uh, have two comments here. I I feel strongly about it. First of all, um, one point um, that I have observed is 
when we got the new constitution in 2015, the UML had turned into a national political establishment. Because in 2015, you know, it was the UML Kepiwali who led the promulgation. Although Nepali Congress was leading the government, was the largest party, KP Oli had a more, more crucial role. That, that was a big shift in terms of where UML was standing. But when KP Oli became prime minister with, with, with close to a two-third majority, he recommended for the dissolution of the parliament not once but twice. That was unconstitutional. Anyone who can read the constitution can see that. And there was a long background about putting that provision in the constitution. That means there is a question about legitimacy on, on current UML leadership's ownership or, or adherence to the new constitution, number one. Number two, the, the right-wing uh, leanings, you know, not, not on every occasion, but on multiple occasions um, that, that KP only reflected is, I have questions about what he really, uh, where he wants to lead UML to, and and I just talked about the electoral alliances, uh, you know, that he he has uh, during this election, and not only that. Look at the situation of the internal democracy in UML. Their last uh, general convention w was a farce. It was not a convention in the sense that UML was conducting uh, conventions in the previous year. Whoever has a critical voice against KP Woli has no space in the UML. So this party in that sense has become as good or as bad as the Maoist in terms of the lack of democracy internally. It's not good for any party, it's not good for UML. So I, I, I wish all the best for the UML supporters and members, but as long as KP Woli is there, one is there is no one direction. It's just like, you know, autocratic and dictatorial way of his, his leadership. It's not going to do well to the party. Two is in terms of what UML is representing. I am not very optimistic about that. So in this election, UML is likely to be number two party again. KP Woli will try to form a government in his own leadership. That, that is, I mean, whether he succeeds or not is a, is a different thing, but he will try. But the real question is, uh, okay, uh, UML is, is, is okay, moderate, left and all that. But UML's major strength has been its uh, uh, nationwide memberships, its, its supporters and the organization. But... When you have a party structure which is dictatorial, which, which has lost all the internal democratic practice that it used to have, even before Nepali Congress started to practice, it's not going to do well to the party. From that point of view, I don't see a very bright future for UML in five years. But if this changes, if this all changes, Again, UML will, will continue to become a strong party, obviously. I'm just saying if, if the current pattern continues, there's less hope. But if it changes, obviously, UML will continue to be a major player. Just to touch upon something very similar. So how do you see the vote went for the Madesh-based parties? Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, it, it was not long ago, you know, we talked about the Constituent Assembly. You know, just, just before that, there was the Madesh movement you know, the rise of the Madesh parties as the regional force and the third force, uh, you know, whatever they sided with, aligned with, they had the power to form government. So in a sense, they were, they were like a kingmaker on, on occasions. And then look at now, you know, wh where they have been. So the, I think the Madesh population, they, they feel that, you know, they're, they're leaders, the leaders of the movement, they have failed them. And, and, they have, you know, shown this uh, at this election also. So it is not that uh, all those issues have been addressed, and and there is no discontent with the Madesh, and you know, you know what they expected the new constitution to be, how they wanted the federal arrangement, you know, under the new constitution to work. It's not satisfactory. Um, we can see that. But in terms of uh, representing that or, or defending that the Madesh leadership, the, the old ones, they have failed. They had failed and the, the election showed that the people also assess it like that. So the rise of Sikhe Raud is an interesting phenomena. Uh, I mean, he started like separatist and, you know, extremist and then, you know, all that. And then it's it's good that he, he decided to join the mainstream politics, you know, accepting the new constitutional, you know, framework for the country. That's good. But the way he defeated Upendra Yadav, the the main leader of Madesh movement, you know, 
it's really interesting so people are impatient they want somebody to represent them legitimately and not just to uh, go to you know, or come to Kathmandu from Madhesh and then uh, just look for being a minister um, and and you know power and resources and and uh, something that the other parties have been doing forever so i think it's a punishment and a very clear punishment and in the far west maybe we, we'll talk about that later also the, the you know phenomena you know resham choudhury who is in prison and in the tharu movement and the rights all that thing i think people have really spoken uh, vocally uh, at this election okay uh, touching on something that is interesting one of the more interesting element in the election results was the performance of the rashtriya swatantra party does the result signify anything what are their opportunities and challenges moving forward it does signify a lot of things um for sure i'll talk about the opportunity or, or the challenge how it may all shape up but what it signifies is you know the the national uh, frustration that has been there you know against the the current political class the rashtriya swatantra party was you know one option that many people have chosen what is interesting there is um, they were formed just 5 months ago what is their ideological inclination obviously you know they have said a few things but not not everything like how do they look at the whole main political course of you know nepal that has started uh, since 2006 you know there's so many issues uh, you know that are still there so important issues but in terms of implementation of federalism and uh, you know the the citizenship issues there's so many issues you cannot just simply okay you cannot become a parliamentarian and say okay i don't i don't care about it or oh, when like political and you know what nepal needs is just like public service delivery and then you know big, big political ideologies are useless it's not going to work i'm not advocating that the new parties should have again these political you know jargon field ideological abstract uh, uh, whatever i'm not talking about that what i'm talking about is in terms of defining them politically they are not there yet so what i'm trying to say is even when people don't know who they really are in in that sense they are elected you know in, a, in an impressive way look at look at kathmandu you know in a kathmandu is an interesting phenomenon you know kathmandu is so impatient if you look at the election results of kathmandu from 1991 the then uh, interim prime minister was defeated and and ganesh man singh was the supreme leader his wife and son had contested in two constituencies both of them were defeated in the in the first election after the restoration of democracy and if you look at the trends in the other elections and and let's just come back to you know balinsa being elected as a mayor against the candidates of nepali congress and uml who have had a strong political organizations in the valley for sh- such a long time and and now the the rashtriya swatantra party candidates also in lalitpur for example and and national wide like in in chitwan so what it reflects is just because a political party leader has been in prison for 10 15 years or has led a political movement or has has given country democracy whatever the people are not simply going to legitimize them time and again through election so what nepal needs what people want is the capacity to to govern to to deliver right so their their history you know uh, is not simply going to uh, uh, be a qualification for them to be you know elected all the time so i think rashtriya swatantra party i think many of the candidates uh, who have won they are interesting they have diverse backgrounds many of them bring the ex- you know expertise from diverse professional backgrounds it's good so i think it will create a pressure on the other old big political parties to develop the capacity i mean being a leader you know being in a political movement for a long time is one thing that's a good thing okay right but when you come to power become a parliamentarian or a minister then you need other skills you need expertise in in the past few years what i've been commenting about the traditional political parties is okay you guys don't have the technical expertise okay you become education minister you don't know much about education now what to do okay one is you could choose the best you know among the worst so okay suppose everyone is the same but you could at least be not corrupt and if you are not co- you don't need any technical skill or expertise not to be corrupt you just need this moral courage and when you, when the minister is not corrupt then a lot of good things could happen so anyway so my point is i think the the rashtriya swatantra party members they bring that expertise and and the zeal and the enthusiasm but on top of all if if the or the parties continue to be how they are they don't have a long future 
that's good. And the other thing is the people's, uh, you know, impatience. You know, they're not just going to wait for a long time. You know, the new, new party, if they don't fare well, again, maybe in five years, there'll be another new party. So you're asking about, okay, what are the opportunities and challenges? So opportunity, they have opportunities alone everywhere, right? There's so much hope and, you know, there's so much enthusiasm and they are the headlines. They are the main stories of this election. The Rashtri Swatantra Party. But I just would like to say, because we should not lose sight of this again, is when we talk about the rise of Rashtri Swatantra Party, that there is also a rise of Sikhe Raut in Eastern Madhesh and the rise of Rashtri Unmukti Party in the Western Nepal, right? Sometimes we lose sight. Why is it important is, uh, in my assessment, it's very preliminary assessment, Rashtri Swatantra Party, some of its leaders, I mean, its main leader and a few others, they seem to have a a little conservative tilt towards looking at, you know, the Nepal's political course and the direction. There are many who have doubted whether they, they, they're like, like too conservative, you know, a little regressive in that sense, you know, the, the not owning federalism because they didn't have, they didn't field any candidates in, in the provincial elections. Is that their political statement? It's just because they don't want it. Have many people who have voted for them is it because of of that that reason? So anyway, so there are questions about their uh, their ownership of the new constitution and the course. In that sense, when we talk about the rise of the new parties, we should not lose sight of the rise of the parties who are championing the voices of of the ethnic groups and and you know regional groups. It it brings a balance. I it I think very good. So when we talk about the rise of the new, and and how the old have lost, who. I mean, lost wherever they have lost. We have to look at all these three three parties together. They are, they are, you know, strength may be different, size will be different, but I think we should look at all of them together. And and finally, you know, I said they have opportunities because, you know, they have the press trust and mandate from the people and that old parties are so delegitimized. And, you know, if they do a small good things, you know, people will just appreciate. But again, people are not going to be very patient in three to six months' time, if the new parties are not performing well, they will just, you know, form alliances with whoever or conservative. I think, you know, people will begin to um, assess them again and board them out in five years. I wish them all the best, right? But opportunities, ample. But challenge, first, uh, not about CK Raut and uh, Rastya Unmukti Party. I think politically they are more clear in terms of where they stand now. Rashtriya Swatantra Party, because of the diverseness it has with its people, I think they have to first have that political identity in terms of simple, like, okay, look, this is where Nepal is. This is how we want to go ahead. This is how we'll play our role in the parliament. Just one one thing to highlight here is uh, there's this um, citizenship bill, which was you know, parliament passed, but the president uh, didn't approve it uh, unconstitutionally, I would like to comment. But the reality is it has not been uh, approved. Now for the new parliament, that will be something, you know, first, initially they have to, the parliament will have to work on that because there are many, you know, thousands of citizens who are just without a citizenship, although they are entitled to. So when I say they need to have a political identity, uh, they need to define themselves as, okay, how are they going to look at the citizenship bill, for example? And that is something that is interconnected with the new constitution, with, with the federalism, with, with everything else. So I think they cannot simply get away by saying that, no, no, we don't care about these big political ideologies where, you know, this like new phase of uh, Nepal and it's just public service delivery. Public service delivery, very important. Governance, very important. Anti-corruption, very important. But for them to stand on all these issues, they need to have that basic political identity and, and consistency or homogeneity among themselves, right? I think that is their main challenge. And, you know, in terms of uh, being formed as a party and structure and all that thing, I think that is something that can take place. But I think that's the first thing they have to start with. I think I also liked for how you said that the rise of the Russia Sotanta party is also the sign of the frustration of the existing political parties. So something the people also used to vent their frustration was the hashtag, no, not again. In your opinion, was this effective? It was effective. By the way, I write a political column in, in Kantibur uh, once in a while. Uh, before the elections were announced for uh, November, expecting that the elections would take place in November, I had argued that uh, you know, the, the top leaderships should be defeated. 
and the, the, uh, I, I had argued that in the, in the light of how undemocratic the political parties are, how there is so much, I mean, so little uh, de internal democracy, how there is no space for new leadership to arise and new ideas to come up in the political parties. So because the parties, uh, the, the current leaderships, they've, they've captured those party structures. You know, they control the membership, how to distribute membership at the local level and how to choose local representatives, who then choose regional representatives and who then change the national representatives and who then change the party president or chairman, right? So it's so closed. And given that, it's not easy to break that and, and let new people, new faces rise in the party. People can punish these old leaders in the, in the respective electoral constituencies by defeating them directly. And I think, no, not again. So in, in, in spirit, it, 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 it's similar. So, which I think was powerful. I mean, there, there were many who said, oh, who is behind it and all that. It, I would not care much, whoever. The, the message was, no, not again. I mean, we, we need new people people we need new faces we need new skills because you know we have already seen them for so many years and then uh, if 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 it's again going to be the same old faces who will be our prime minister and minister there's not much to hope so i think that that movement was effective in his spirit and, and what i like about it is the the old political class has been rightly politically harassed. I mean, harassment, harassment is not a good word for anyone. So, I, you know, I just would like to qualify this. But because the way they have been harassing Nepali people for such a long time, they deserve this political uh, harassment. And, and humiliation, let's, I think humiliation is a better word. So they have been humiliated. And the mandate, I think, elections have already taken place and we'll, we'll get the full results in a few days. But I think the mandate of this election is that there should be new people. There should be a transfer of... Uh, a leadership within the political parties in terms of who comes to lead the government we already talked about how the alliances you know will be formed to to form a government because not one party will have a majority as we see but when that happens again i think there should be new leaderships from these even old parties i think that is the message of no not again and i think that's again it, it it's very consistent with with the rise of the Rashtriya Swatantra Party and, and the other new independent uh, candidates. So are you interpreting the results of the proportional representation where UML and the Nepal Congress have a significant lead and are in competition for first place, followed by the Rashtriya Swatantra Party and the Maoists who are competing for a distant third? I think so far the uh, UML and Congress have not done as good as they would have if they were not Rashtriya Swatantra Party. Uh, you know, Rastriya Swatantra Party, again, you know, they are fielded candidates in so many places, despite them being formed just like a few months before the election, right, which is really impressive. Again, like I say, I just would like to repeat that. People didn't care who, who these people are, like the new people, but I just don't like those old ones, so maybe the new ones will be a better one. So in that light, the PR uh, votes that UML has got um, and, and the Congress, they still, yeah, you said it rightly, they will they will still be number one and two between UML and Congress. But the Sotantra Party, Rastya Sotantra Party is coming probably in number three. Uh, between them and the Maoists seem to be a competition, let's see, uh, nationally. That tells a lot because PR vote, how many seats they will get for the parliament based on the PR votes is one thing. But the, it's a popular vote. And it's if not in favor of somebody, it's against you know somebody. So that is a political message. Because for me, election, of course, I mean everything at the end comes to you know mathematics. You know the numbers, like whether you have a majority in the parliament to form a government and all that thing. Obviously, numbers are important because there's nothing better. But uh, also, election is important for the mandate, for the deep underlying message. And the message is again change of leadership not the old faces. And as you raised earlier, the no, not again means no, not again, the same faces in the government. What I'm simply hoping, it may still be a little unrealistic hope, but what I'm still hoping is that uh, the election will give us a new face as a prime minister. Like I guess I'm aware it's not very realistic having known these people for <laughs> such a long time, but I think the underlying message of PR boards also is that. So also the last elections weren't only for the federal government, but we also had the uh, elections for the provincial levels. So how are you interpreting the results at the provincial level? 
the uh, national media and you know in general uh, there was less attention to the provincial elections which is a sad thing in my opinion it's because you know i have a comment here about uh, federalism before coming to this because it's it's important it's it's interconnected it's uh, nepali congress uh, but more uml they were forced to accept federalism because of the movements especially in the in the madesh Uh, they were not pro federal i mean which is fine i mean it's okay to, i mean people can be pro federal or anti federal or neutral that's not a problem what i'm saying is they were forced to accept it that's because they were forced to accept and and because they never liked it um heartily there was this apathy you know if the federalism does not work well that's okay that's how they started and and in the, in the last 5 years which was the first election after the new constitution that the federal government whoever was in party you know there may be a difference in degree but they did not try to empower they rather try to disempower the provincial governments and when there is not much power uh, you know given to them transport and resources and all that thing power means everything you know so the it didn't become much attractive you know so everyone said oh national and central government is everything um, uh, like in you know in a, in a non federal structure that's why there was less attention and many uh, senior political leaders they didn't want to fill their candidacy and rashtriya swatantra party they didn't fill any candidate again in in the provincial election i mean again that may be a big political statement let's see on their part so uh, what is likely now is that in in the provinces also there will not be one single party which will come under majority to form a government there will be alliances but obviously obviously those alliances will be different say in um, one province there may be one party leading the government with with a few others in another so i think it's going to be pretty pretty mixed um, in the provincial elections the initial results indicate that a hung parliament is likely how do you think this will impact the future of nepali politics and more importantly what does it mean for the issue of policy making and governance in nepal it is a very important topic to discuss about actually it is it is most likely not only in this election previous and upcoming as long as we have this mixed system of elections the proportionate representative and the first past the post it's always likely that we'll have a hung parliament which means it it gives power you know the the undeserved power to the same old political class because they can form alliances so the fact that or the likely fact that we will have a hung parliament again is not good for the country that means um in the next 5 years it's less likely that we will have one government one government which will complete its tenure that's one two is in terms of again the you know forming alliance the coalition for the uh, new government everyone will come together and how they will come is it's all political bargain it's just not a bargain um, between the parties it's a bargain internal you know within the party there are different factions and all that thing and so when you become a minister on the power you know basis of a faction and then you are loyal to that faction and and your whole attention would be to collect resources in an undue way and you know and and the repeat basically the same thing number one number two is w- when you have a coalition in a hung parliament a coalition to lead the government you cannot choose people the most competent people even within the political parties to to make ministers you know to lead different um, you know portfolios it's always a power balance among the parties so okay say nepali congress will lead the government with, with the maoist and say with one or other party and then the congress leadership cannot choose the ministers from the maoist and whoever pushpa kamal dal nominates will become the minister and whom he will nominate in terms of you know party balance and all that thing it's not based on competence and other factor so anyway so it's 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 a sad thing but it's a, it's a, it's a reality it's going to be a reality again what is important is of course election is something that elects people you know to to govern for 5 years but democracy is 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 a process and political parties are important of course vehicle but you know the, the media and the civil society and the public and the, the constant uh, you know watch uh, over their performance and, and uh, you know how how people are aware you know in terms of watching we don't have a system to to recall you know the candidates if they don't perform well but i think that that watch from the public and the media and the civil society is is going to be key just to hope you know 
let's hope. I mean, it's just that we're still to get the full election results. So I don't want to talk about, you know, pessimistic thing. I'm just being realistic that we know it's going to be a hung parliament. We know it's going to be a group of parties who will, who will come together to form a government. And whoever comes, you know, together, the, the smaller ones, although there's the rise of the new parties, they will not have the power to be the leader in the government, but they will have the power to create a good pressure for others to perform better. So let's let's hope that things will be better, but yeah, hung parliament is going to be a reality. Before I let you go, could you give your thoughts on Nepal's electoral practice? I mean, we seem to be eternally hopeful in this particular act of democracy, which is meant to provide a chance for citizens to be heard and for democracy to correct its course. But we know that the process has many limitations from financial cost and irregularities to issues of inclusion. So in other words, is all of this exercise worth it? Or are there things we need to do? You know, obviously this is worth it, but I'm not saying it, it, is, it is enough. There's a lot to be done to make it more worth, uh, to make it you know, as worth as, as the Nepali people deserve. So, but it's a very important question. Why this question is important is before election, when the elections are announced, there is infighting within the party in terms of who gets the candidacy, you know, that the electoral ticket to become a candidate. And there is the politics. It's a, it's a bad practice. So if you are loyal to the party president or like what they look at is, OK, if, the, if this guy is going to be elected, will he or she vote for me or not to become the leader of the parliament, like leader of the political party? And then if I'm elected as the parliamentary party leader in the party, then I can become the prime minister. So you demand that loyalty. You don't look at the competence. You don't look at the history. You don't look at, you know, all the potential of that candidate. What you look at is the loyalty, the personal loyalty. That has to change. How can that change? When there is internal democracy, when, when, when there is like open, competitive democracy within the parties, then those who are capable will come to lead. And then there has to be a primary, internal primary um, elections. And then when, when you're elected through a primary, then you can become a candidate rather than your party boss in Kathmandu giving these uh, tickets for you to become a candidate in, in, in Kailali or Ilam. So if there's a primary and you, you need to be elected locally, then you become the party candidate. That's just one, one step. And then, you know, in terms of electoral alliances also, I think there's a lot to change. And this will allow people to, to choose. Look at this current election. Um, you have the Congress and the Maoist going to election as one alliance. And, and they belong to, they're so ap apart from each other, ideologically from their orientation and everything. It doesn't offer people much choice. And then you have the UML, you know, forming alliance with, with, with the RPP, for example. And you have the Madesh based parties and look at the tragedy for the Madesh, you know, population. Then you have one of your parties aligning with the UML and the other with the Congress. So it didn't offer that choice. So there's so many bad practices. I, I'm just, you know, saying some that I just, you know, think about now. But there are many things to improve. And a lot of them starts, you know, with with the reform of the political parties, the internal democracy, and this will this will contribute to a better, you know, environment uh, for elections and and for people to elect even better um, candidates. And lastly, are there any words or messages that you would like to convey to our listeners? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to congratulate the Nepali uh, people, you know, for their um, for their uh, uh, moral courage you know, to go, you know, beyond the, you know, traditional uh, boat, you know, patterns. They, they, have, they have shown that the, the, the old political class can be challenged. I think they have demonstrated very clearly that the Nepali people want change. So the message for change, I think that has come out very clearly, uh, which is something that gives me hope. And also that, uh, you know, if the new parties are also do not perform well, you know, the Nepali people are not going to wait. So the rise of the new is going to create a lot of pressure for the old ones to reform. I would not care whether we have a new one or old one. What we want is a, is a good one, right? So I think this election gives that hope and I'm, I'm generally optimistic about that. Thank you, Vishnu, once again for being with us on today's show. I wish you all the very best for your future endeavors. Thank you, Saurabh. It was a pleasure uh, talking with you. Thank you.
Thanks for listening to Pause by PI. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Bishnu on the early results of the recent concluded 2022 general elections, the implications for the major political parties, the rise of the independence, and the future of Nepali politics and policymaking. Today's episode is part of The Brief. It was produced by me, Saurabh Lama, with support from Nirjun Rai, Kushi Hang, Aparna Paudel, and Sharon Kongsakar. The episode was recorded at PEI Studio and edited by Sharon Kongsakar. Our theme music is courtesy of Rohit Shakya from Zindabad. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast. Also, please do us a favor by sharing us on social media and leaving a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to the show. For PEI's video-related content, please search for Policy Entrepreneurs on YouTube. To catch the latest from us on Nepal's policy and politics, please follow us on Twitter at Tweet2PEI. That's Tweet followed by the number 2 and PEI and on Facebook at Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. You can also visit PEI.center to learn more about us. Thanks once again from me, Saurabh Lama. We'll see you soon in our next episode.